Are you wanting to reduce the likelihood you get dementia, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative conditions like that? If so, this is the video for you. If you're okay accepting that's going to be your fate, then this isn't going to be for you. One of the most important things you can do in preventing your risk of getting dementia or any other type of neurodegenerative condition is to have good cardiovascular health. So that is what we are going to look at today is the role of cardiovascular health in neurodegenerative conditions, as well as what are three lab markers that you can get done at any lab to know where you stand today. So you can draw that line in the sand and say, I'm not getting dementia and I'm going to stack the deck in my favor. So let's get right into it. I'm Dr. Z. I'm known as the brain guy. This was a study and a write-up done. So this August 30th, 2023, early action to control cardiovascular risk factors preserves brain metabolism. So early action. I get a lot of people who come in with active dementia. And they're like, well, what can we do? Honestly, when you're at that active level, maybe we can slow it down. Maybe we hold you steady. But when you've got a pretty progressed dementia, there's no reversing it. Okay, Not at least at this point in time, no matter what anyone says. It's not done. Um, mild cognitive impairment, subjective cognitive impairment. Yes, definitely have seen that improve them. And then brain metabolism. So this is the rate at which your cells take up as well as use energy. So what they did was they did imaging studies um, looking at glucose uptake. What we're going to see here in the green heart, that is going to be heart healthy, no cardiovascular disease. Whereas we look at the red, that is cardiovascular disease. Now, when you look at the pictures up top compared to the pictures on the bottom, you say, okay, um, I see a little bit less green, not tremendously, but a little bit. I see a lot more red though. And I see a lot more orange and yellow up top compared to the bottom. So that is glucose uptake. Now, if the brain cannot uptake glucose in the way it can't, should, it's going to be unhealthy. I want you to think about this like a car. So imagine you're used to driving a Honda Civic and getting 35 miles per gallon and you make it off of 10 gallons of gas. What happens when I give you 10 gallons of gas and you now have an F-350 and you're getting maybe what, 10 miles per gallon? Are you going to be able to drive the same distance? No, you will not. So you cannot accomplish the same thing. And the same thing is true for your brain. When the brain's not as healthy, it does not uptake glucose in the same way. And ultimately, your brain cannot do its job well. From the neurons to the immune cells, donors for microglial cells. Cardiovascular disease is a big factor in this. So part of maintaining your brain health is really knowing where you're at from a cardiovascular perspective. So first, where are we going to go? We're going to look at something called apolipoprotein B. For the longest time, everything's been about total cholesterol and LDL. But LDL is it's kind of getting pushed aside because as more and more research comes out on apolipoprotein B, that tends to have a bigger influence on blood vessel health and cardiovascular disease than LDL does itself. Now, <clears throat> what they found when they did this, here's the interpretation is, Higher ApoB shortens lifespan, increases risk of heart disease and stroke. And this is even in those where they looked at LDL cholesterol and things like that. So knowing where you're at plays a big role. Now, <clears throat> they were looking at people that had issues, you know, and family members, but this still goes to the general population. The higher your ApoB, the greater likelihood you will have issues. Now, you may be wondering, well, what's a good ApoB level? Most labs are looking at less than 90. But if you have increased risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as obesity, hypertension, smoking, and some of these other factors we're talking about in labs, you know, then 90 may actually be too high. Some people actually shoot for less than 80 or even less than 70. But by knowing where you stand, you can address it. Now, the next one that goes with apolipoprotein B is lipoprotein little a. So lipoprotein little a is a blend of genetic as well as environmental influences to get the level where it is. When we look at this here, so 
High levels of lipoprotein little a are an independent and causal risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease through mechanisms with increased atherogenesis, inflammation, and thrombosis. So atherosclerosis is your blood vessels, can they're not able to constrict and open in the way they should um, because of the lining and the pliability gets impacted and there's also placking in there. This is due to the way it acts and creating inflammation and the thrombosis is more plotting a risk potential. Now this one, once again, has a lot of family genetics influencing it. So if your family member has cardiovascular disease, you really need to know where you're at on this. The earlier you know, the better. But once again, this can also be addressed. And then it's just another picture of it, as well as, you know, 20% of people worldwide have high LPA. <clears throat> and this is a picture on atherogenesis. So if you're like, well, I really didn't know what you were saying. You see how you've got the red here, okay? So that's the outer part of your blood vessel. Now you've got here, you've got the red where you see it kind of more open here and then it narrows here. So that's the atherosclerosis. So you get all this placking that develops and it ultimately shrinks the diameter of the blood vessel. So imagine you're used to driving on the highway, you've got four lanes, but now you're down to two lanes. That's gonna create havoc on the highway, but it does the same thing within your blood vessels. Can also impact um, the valves in your heart, as well as once again, thrombosis. So that's the risk of clots and, you know, so whether it's a heart attack or a stroke. Now, the last marker I want you to know about is TMAO, trimethylamine and oxide. Okay. Um, so this is ultimately produced in the gut as a byproduct of foods that we're eating. Now, I'm going to review the foods. But not everyone who eats these foods is going to have high levels. And that's why I prefer test, don't guess. It comes from red meats, eggs, saltwater fish. Ultimately, you eat it, you ingest it. So the L-carnitine component comes in, your gut has to break it down, and then it's got to be excreted out through your kidneys. Okay, And your liver also does a little bit as well. But if for whatever reason you're not able to do that well, as a result we see TMAO impacts bile acids, okay? So that's gallbladder, liver, um, cholesterol, transport and usage. Also, it's gonna impact atherosclerosis, which we've talked about. So once again, we see more of an opening here and then it gets thinner, okay? So the diameter gets impacted. It's gonna ultimately impact the platelets, increase the risk of thrombosis. And as a result, increase the likelihood of stroke, heart attack, heart failure. But they've also done research that shows a link or a correlation with progression of Parkinson's disease based upon TMAO levels. Now, a normal TMAO level is really less than about six or seven, depending on the lab. And, but knowing where you're at allows you to create a plan of action. And as we previously talked about, guess what? All of these markers, you can get done at a regular lab, whether it's lab court quest through your hospital, whatever it is, Know your ApoB, know your lipoprotein little a, and know your TMAO levels now so you can start creating a plan of attack to reduce your risk of getting dementia, but also cardiovascular disease because cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in the United States. And then all of the dementias, whether it's you know Alzheimer's, vascular, Lewy body, now we've got Parkinson's building up and a lot of those ultimately end in dementia. Most of these are completely preventable in my opinion. But you have to start early. If you wait for damage that's been done for 50 years, 60 years, and you're like, okay, well, what can you do for me? There's not as much. But if you find when it starts getting elevated or has only been elevated for a short period of time, there's so much that you can do, okay? This is a slow process that damages over time. So once again, the earlier you can do it, the better off you'll be. You'll maintain your brain health. You'll reduce your risk of getting Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, and other things like that. But you'll also maintain the health of your heart. Hope you found this information useful and that you're going to be able to take this with you to help maintain your brain health for the long term. If you have comments, questions, please let me know. This is Dr. Z. And until next time, 
you know, if you'd like to learn more, please check out my other videos. Also visit my website, idlebrainandbody.com. And you can follow me on any social media at Dr. S. Zimmerman. And once again, hope you found this useful. You control your destiny. You control your fate. And it starts today.